My wife took me down to Bourbon County once, and the minute I walked up to that first Rick House, there's just this breeze, and it just hits you right in the face. And I was hooked from that moment. It just, it's this beautiful aroma, and just hearing the stories and seeing the way in which people care about it, it was amazing. And I've been hooked on Bourbon ever since. There's a lot of misconceptions about bourbon out there. A lot of times people will sit at the bar and ask what the difference between bourbon and whiskey is, when in fact bourbon's just a, a category of whiskey. People think often like, oh, it has to be from Kentucky or there's, there's certain other kind of myths out there, when in fact really there's just three things that are necessary to be called a bourbon. It has to be made in the U.S., it's a distinctly American product. It has to be made from a mash of at least 51% corn and has to be aged in new charred American oak. The history of bourbon is tied up completely with the history of the United States. The name bourbon actually comes from kind of post-revolutionary times when Americans had this fascination with the French. So when you're in Kentucky, there are towns that are named after French places and French people, but they're all horribly mispronounced. So bourbon is named after the Bourbon family, but of course we call it bourbon. Is That fascination really took over and, and, and named the region where this whiskey was originally coming from. They say that it started in that area because when Thomas Jefferson was the governor of Virginia, there was like a homestead law that was passed where if farmers grew a certain amount of corn to lay claim to that land, they were able to keep a certain amount of acreage. And so when they were doing that, they ended up with extra corn. And these were Scots-Irish immigrants coming down from Pennsylvania and New York State and Maryland. And so they already had a distilling culture and a distilling history. So they, they naturally became farmer distillers. You had the upheaval of the Whiskey Rebellion, and you saw legal battles happen within politics defining a spirit, which is one of the most highly regulated as to what can be called that, and what can be called straight whiskey, what can be called blended whiskey. Um, you know, you saw the Bottled and Bond Act of 1897. You saw the Taft decision where the U.S. president just got involved in a dispute between rectified whiskey makers and straight bourbon makers and said, you now can call this this, and you can call this this, and those standards are still held up today. Imported spirits became much more popular, single malt scotches, things like that. Uh, and then bourbon makers in the late 80s, early 90s kind of recognized that and decided to kind of show people how good they can do by offering different products. Elmer T. Lee came out with Blanton's Founders Reserve, the original single barrel bourbon. Booker No at uh, Jim Beam started coming out with Knob Creek. So we saw Elijah Craig come from Heaven Hill Distilleries. So we just started seeing American whiskey makers show the world that our products are just as good and, and highlight the best of them. Around that same time, it was the late 80s, early 90s, we were seeing the same kind of craft beer movement. We saw amazing breweries like Goose Island, Deschutes, come out uh, in 88 and, and really kind of revolutionize the, the craft beer market. And consumers just started kind of moving towards well-crafted, high-quality product. And so the relationship between those two is, is kind of great and kind of natural. Over the last 20 or 30 years, we've seen kind of a resurgence in cocktail culture. For a long time, I think people were making drinks to mask the flavor of spirit. I remember growing up and people saying, oh man, this is so good, you can't even taste the liquor. And I think we're seeing people go the other way in a really great way. When we make a cocktail, we want to emphasize the flavors that are already natural in the spirit. And we don't want to mask any of those, we want to emphasize them. There's some good kind of byproducts of, of some of the laws that exist in bourbon. You know, those, those barrels can only be used once, and so they have to be discarded after the bourbon is made. And so who better to make use of them than these new craft breweries trying to do cool stuff? And so we end up with amazing bourbon barrel aged beers, and, and there's still a lot of life left in that barrel. And so it's just wonderful that we can take that barrel and follow it along its life and, and see it go from making an amazing bourbon to go ahead and then making an amazing beer right behind it. I mean, I immediately get coconut and vanilla right off the nose. You know, bourbon barrel vanilla flavor, but the coconut is, is something different that I think could only come from the beer bourbon combination. Mm -hmm. 